the force of the original language is lost in translation, although it is intuited. You must name him Jesus because he is the one who will save his people from their sins. The root of saving is there quite clearly and the way in which eventually no other human would normally in a Christian setting bear that name is interesting for until then it was a name that could be used. We have Joshua in the Old Testament, it is the same name, and the power of this name is something I would like to dwell on for a few seconds. In one of the readings we had these last days, which was actually from Sophonia, we had the Lord preparing his people through giving them a pure speech, a pure lip in the Hebrew. And this question of honouring the name that saves us is something that we need to bear, uh, my, bear in mind, especially at Christmas time, when subtly a part of Christ's full title is disappearing from the scene. If one looks carefully, it's just being eroded, and it's no longer really correct in certain situations to talk about Christmas as such. It is the holiday. And it is just one more signal with regard to the withdrawal of the rights of God. But there are subtle ways also in which those rights are withdrawn, even among Christians themselves. The question of the use only for prayer of any form of the name of God. One wonders why in certain specific Christian cultures for many centuries there has been more elasticity than in others with regard to the use of God when it is not actually being used in prayer. And tendentially, those same cultures which are elastic already in that are also elastic in the use of this holy name. The reason, I suppose, is to be sought in the fact that they make appeal to what is part of their mindset, and therefore they make appeal to Jesus Christ, and in certain Catholic countries, to the Madonna. In other words, they take what is available, the B-side is that they're taking what is also most precious and making it available for the wrong end. It happens even amongst the pious. If one were to just calmly observe how even in places of consecrated life, things are handled verbally. The first indication that control is being lost is that the words change. They no longer remain neutral, but heavier words are brought into the equation. The voice also tends to be raised, but the sacred tendentially also comes into it. One makes appeal to what is there readily at hand, and normally God and all that goes with him is fairly easily available. And so, in fact, in even places where God officially is being honoured quite a lot, and even professionally, that other bit too is coming in, sometimes more than one would expect. And yet, few seem ever to pause and ask, what is going on here? Can we actually, in prayer, be even bowing the head, I mean, even physically, at the holy name of Jesus, and then, in another context, but in the same place, not realise what's going on if one is actually, yes, bringing God down to our level and offending him, showing at that point, at least in our existence, that we're not in a mode of prayer, at least at that point, 
and we're not, at least at that point, in mode of relationship either. Something has gone. It's no longer one linear movement. One cannot offer up as a prayer all the actions of the day and all the words and all the thoughts, as quite a lot of us would in the morning, if some of those words in practice are sins, offences. We're playing the game precisely of the same force which wants to remove Christ from Christmas. With regard to the specific scene that we have in the Gospel, it is actually quite touching. In the case of our Blessed Lady, the Archangel Gabriel is sent, as it were, physically and visibly. In the case of Joseph, in continuity of mode with his interior and quiet and withdrawn personality, it happens just with a dream, more than once. Dreams, normally, as we know, are just an ongoing of the world of the subconscious, the brain, the mind, working overtime, sorting out things that come in the day, and also perhaps worrying about things to come. But some dreams are not just dreams. We may have had experience of that ourselves. We wake up and we remember all the details and one talks about it and one thinks about it maybe for years to come. It wasn't like the others and it was so real that one wonders was there a message in that, some premonition. And indeed, if one listens to people, and it would be our role in the ordained ministry to be doing that, one will find after a certain time that quite a few do actually come out with this question of a dream, which wasn't like any dream, and something actually might be in that, that it is a way, and it's actually something that people have studied in some detail, honorology, the study of dreams, that can sometimes be used. Actually, I believe St. Thomas Aquinas goes into it. It is a means of communication sometimes between the heavenly realm and our own. It can be, for instance, allowed by divine providence that somebody on the other side from our family might be in need of prayer, and this could be one fairly gentle means of getting a hint through to us. Don't forget so-and-so. And sometimes they appear later on in a dream, another dream, in great light, and so on. It happens, it has always happened. But there are other things too that sometimes we can glean from this world of dreams, and it's this. Without there having to be huge communication going on, there can just be this other element. There can be a salutary warning. We can have a dream in which we believe, because we're there in this virtual reality, which is the only one there before our mind's eye when we're dreaming, so we believe it, and we engage with it, and we react to it as though it were the only one. So we can wake up then and see a virtual reality and our reactions to it, how dreadful it would be, or whatever. And that in itself can actually be a salutary lesson, because it can stop us from doing something or it can make us realize we ought to do something which we're not doing. In other words, dreams can have a providential effect and impact in our life, and not necessarily be of any supernatural order. But again, through divine permission, can be instruments for us to have a second thought, or to get our act together. They can help us, sometimes. I just conclude. What is interesting in the case of Joseph is his docility. He always says yes and without any fuss or bother. And it's the bottom line too, both in his interior life and that of our Blessed Lady, the virtual and never withdrawn fiat. Let it be, let it be, let it be. Something that we need to have also in our attitude to life. Not too much attachment to anything in particular, just let the will of God be, all the rest. I am free from.